This week on Waterways. Biscayne National Park's Maritime Heritage Trail and prescribed fires in the Everglades. Biscayne National Park and all national parks are owned by the people of the United States. Park managers act as stewards of the national treasures contained within the parks. At Biscayne, the staff reaches out to educate and inspire the public about the park's treasures. Visitors to Biscayne National Park can see outstanding natural wonders, coral reefs, beautiful tropical fish, meadows of seagrass, but also, under these waters is a rich cultural heritage in the form of sunken ships. Biscayne National Park is welcoming visitors to explore the Biscayne Maritime Heritage Trail, six shipwrecks that tell different stories and offer different adventures. The reason we're choosing those six sites is because we've got the level of documentation on them necessary to be able to effectively monitor the site. And also, they provide a safe and accessible uh, experience for park snorkelers or divers. We will no doubt be adding more sites to the Heritage Trail in the future. However, until we get the level of documentation that's necessary for each one of those sites, it will, we can expect to average adding one or two sites every few years. Like the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary's Shipwreck Trail, the Biscayne Maritime Heritage Trail emerged from a need to provide a unique recreational experience for park visitors and simultaneously to educate visitors about the challenges of managing shipwrecks. For Biscayne National Park is a veritable graveyard for ships. Dozens have found a final resting place beneath these waters. The reason why there's so many shipwrecks in the Florida Keys is a combination of natural and cultural factors. The natural factors are uh, prevailing easterly winds like we're experiencing today also very shallow coral reefs. But the most amazing uh, natural factor that really describes why there's so many shipwrecks is the Florida Straits, or the Gulf Stream. Very uh, powerful, super highway, a current that runs 100 miles per day northward. So unsuspecting seamen would try and stay out of the brunt of the Gulf Stream if they were heading southbound and they'd hug the shallow reefs a little bit too close before the easterly winds would pile them up on top of it. The geography of the Keys, coupled with South Florida hurricanes, are natural factors contributing to the wrecking of ships. But there were many cultural factors, like inaccurate navigation tools and a ship's inability to fight the forces of nature that caused dozens of human casualties over hundreds of years. To date, Biscayne National Park has surveyed only about 14% of its waters. Within that 14%, 43 shipwrecks have been located. In the future, Brenda and her staff, using a statistical model, estimate that 76 shipwrecks exist within Biscayne National Park. The northernmost wreck on the Biscayne Maritime Heritage Trail is the Aratune Apcar, which was built in Scotland in 1861. Wreckers in the Florida Keys had been cursing the installation of the lighthouses that were being put up in the 1870s and earlier along the Florida Keys because they viewed them as threatening their very existence. Fowey Lighthouse Tower began to be constructed in 1876. In 1878, the finishing touches were being put on it. The crewmen who had already lit the tower and were working on building the platform were horrified one night in 1878 when they saw a huge vessel heading straight for the tower. The remains of the ship can be found today, hundreds of feet away from the lighthouse tower. 
Next on the Biscayne National Park Maritime Heritage Trail, south of the Eratu Napcar, is the Lugano Wreck, one of Brenda's favorite sites on the trail. This is because the wreck is huge. It stretches 400 feet long and more than 50 feet wide. The Lugano was built in 1882 in England and sank on March 9, 1913 at Long Reef en route from Liverpool to Havana. At the time of its sinking in 1913, it was the largest ship to ever sink in the Florida Keys. Now when it sank, as if that wasn't bad enough, within 10 years, it was still such a hazard to navigation. Other shipwrecks were piling into the Lugano, even though it was sitting in 27 feet of water, that the Coast Guard had to come along and blow up the remains of the hull. Every piece of frame that exists along this 400-foot wreck is habitat to lobsters. Soft corals cover the hull. The ship is slowly disintegrating due to repeated storms and constant wave action. Adverse conditions have not yet affected the Mandalay, the next wreck south on the Maritime Trail. Built in 1928 in the U.S., the steel hold schooner was known at the red carpet ship of the Windjammer fleet. The Mandalay is considered the quintessential shipwreck in Biscayne National Park. When it was constructed in 1928, it was built as a luxury yacht to sail around the world. It was built out of teak, ivory, uh, it was, had two massive water tanks on it so that there would always be a source of fresh water and the largest fuel tank you'll ever see on any two-masted luxury sailing yacht. The Mandalay sank on New Year's Eve, just hours before midnight at Long Reef en route from the Bahamas to Miami. The vertical relief of the Mandalay provides a phenomenal habitat for marine creatures. Through years of growth, it has become a biological treasure as well as an archaeological treasure. Next on the trail is the Earl King, constructed of steel in 1865 in Scotland and which sank in 1891. The years surrounding 1865 were pivotal in ship construction in the Florida Keys and the rest of the United States. During this time, shipbuilders shifted from building wooden ships powered by wind to iron ships powered by steam. It was initially en route from Liverpool to New Orleans when it sank in 1891, carrying a cargo of construction material the next wreck on the Maritime Heritage Trail is the Alicia, built in 1883 in Scotland and which ran aground on April 20th, 1905 at Ajax Reef en route from Liverpool to Havana. The Alicia was laden with silks, silverware, and other fine household items. The ensuing heated claims to the wreck by dozens of wreckers initiated another turning point in maritime history when that vessel went down, because the goods were considered to be so wealthy, it actually created quite the brouhaha over the salvage of the vessel and the ensuing illegitimate activities by wreckers that followed who were salvaging that vessel changed U.S. Admiralty Court law forever. They literally at one point painted a black line down the middle of Alicia and allocated wreckers to work on one side of the line or the other. The final wreck highlighted on the Maritime Heritage Trail in Biscayne National Park is simply called the Wooden Sailing Vessel. This is because the identity of the wreck is unknown. 19th century wooden sailing ships were the time when the Florida Straits were being used as a super highway, both for coastal trade and international trade. The remains of the 19th century wooden sailing vessel exemplify what these sites look like in the Florida Keys today. Managers of shipwrecks practice what is called conservation archaeology. The premise of conservation archaeology is that these sites need to be preserved for future archaeologists because people today can't predict the questions historians will be asking in the future. To remove these wrecks from the ocean floor, 
would forever change them. In the past, up until about the 1960s, archaeologists excavated sites, fully excavated sites. And there was, there was kind of a joke that archaeology was the controlled destruction of a site. And it was assumed that the archaeologists' data, the field journals and the photographs and the site plans, would have to suffice if someone in the future wanted to go back and look at what was there. There's a perception that the ocean is a very inhospitable place for sunken ships. Historically, underwater archaeologists viewed the collection of artifacts and the rescuing of shipwrecks from the sea floor as a race against time. We now know, because science has told us, that there are many microenvironments in the ocean where the shipwrecks are actually better preserved, being in place. And they call it in situ preservation because the way that the shipwrecks have stabilized through time, the rate of deterioration is minimal compared to what goes on when you bring something out of a saltwater environment and then try to conserve it. Brenda's work isn't just about the preservation of history. Her main desire is to educate the public about the region's maritime past. One valuable tool created by Brenda's staff is an underwater dive card for each site. These cards provide the architectural blueprints and a brief history of the wreck, as well as information about safety hazards. Unfortunately, many park visitors today, when they snorkel on a shipwreck or dive on a shipwreck, feel that it's okay to pick up and move an artifact or maybe slip a little bronze fastener into their buoyancy compensator vest and take it home as a souvenir. It's these relic collectors that really aren't intentionally trying to hurt the site that are having the worst impact on each one of these shipwrecks. In the last 30 or 40 years, extremely stringent laws have been enacted that make looting shipwrecks a violation, punishable by a prison sentence and or a financial penalty. Looting is a very serious matter. Removing even the smallest artifacts is illegal. The ships lying beneath Biscayne's waters once traveled all over the Atlantic and the Caribbean. Their histories are as varied as the people who call South Florida home. This is one reason why Brenda believes that the Maritime Heritage Trail is the perfect outreach tool for people who live nearby. They, like all Americans, are owners of this national park, yet many have never visited. Biscayne's proximity to Miami get, provides us with marvelous opportunities to instill a sense of ownership for the ethnically diverse community members of Miami. Shipwrecks are a great catalyst to do that. The reason for that is because for 500 years, vessels have been sailing, flying different flags, different nationalities. So get off the couch, put on a mask and snorkel, and come experience the wonders of Biscayne National Park. Bring the family, bring your friends, dive into the world below the water's surface, and take a journey on the Maritime Heritage Trail. What do plants and trees need to grow? Water, nutrients, fire? You bet, especially in South Florida. Fire is a historic part of the natural ecology. During the tumultuous rainy season, lightning would regularly ignite the landscape. South Florida is an extremely fire-prone area, and this whole region evolved to burn. Throughout North America and probably throughout the world, most vegetation has a fire history. It has a relationship with fire. Most vegetation will burn at some time. In Florida, we have vegetation that thrives on fire. As a fire ecologist at Everglades National Park, Rick Anderson's job is to understand the role of fire in the ecosystem. Over the years, the way the Park Service handles fire 
has changed as its understanding of fire's role in the ecosystem has evolved. When the park was established, there was a sensibility that, uh, that this forest needed to be protected from fire. And I think, what I think probably, uh, it was an imported thinking about national parks. And as the Everglades got drained, the fires became more and more uh, destructive, if you will, taking a lot more topsoil, and there's a lot of large-scale fires. At face value, putting out all fires seemed logical to early park managers. It was something the Park Service had been doing since its inception. From Yellowstone to Yosemite and all the Western National Parks, it only made sense that managers would suppress fires in South Florida. But the idea that the ecosystem needed to be protected from fire shifted as tropical hardwood vegetation began encroaching into the pine forests. Without fire, ground-level vegetation and pine trees became too dense for pine tree seedlings to survive. Park scientists noticed that the ecosystem was changing. And one of the first to, to notice that and start looking at that in a uh, scientific type of way was Dr. Bill Robertson. He started looking at change over time and he was probably among a group of people that was the first to suggest that maybe using fire here was a good idea to help bring back the system in a way that was functional, that was more native and more like the pre-settlement forest that might have been here. Wildlife biologists also noticed a lot of species like bluebirds, wild turkey, and bobwhite quail suffered without fire. They named them fire-loving, those animals whose population dwindled without fire. Without fires to burn back the vegetation, these species were losing nesting and feeding grounds. These scientists also realized that by preventing the landscape from catching fire, they were inadvertently creating a more fire-prone environment. One way to put it is, the longer any site or any place in a flammable landscape goes without fire, the more vulnerable it is to fires that we can't control. The prescribed burns typically begin in May and last throughout the summer. This is the natural time of year for fires, the rainy season, and hence, the lightning season. The time of year, May, June, July, August, and September, the fires were set here by lightning, it became obvious that that was probably how the plants and the ecosystem evolved with fire. Everglades National Park has a staff of fire starters and fighters who carefully execute detailed plans established by Rick Anderson and his team. Led by Dave Loveland, the process of a prescribed burn begins more than two years in advance, but the overall burn rotation is actually planned almost 30 years in advance. Dave Loveland explains the process the day of a burn. What we'll do is we'll come in in the morning and start our notification processes, let everybody know that we are going to be burning in, in that area um, for the next day or two. Um, we'll contact the Florida Department of Forestry for a burn permit and do our smoke monitoring, uh, uh, assure that there will be no sensitive smoke receptors downwind, um, for example, an airport or a hospital or school, and then put together a plan for the number of res number and kind of resources we need to be able to do the burn, be it you know, one or two engines, um, a helicopter, X number of firefighters. Igniting fires in the Pinelands takes only a few hours. Fire spreads quickly through the understory of saw palmettos. From the ashes, these plants survive and thrive with the presence of fire. Higher water levels in the rainy season help control the spread of fire. But as many fire technicians will attest, no two wildfires are alike. Similarly, no two prescribed burns are alike. The crew will spend the rest of the afternoon and into the evening supervising the fire's progress to make sure it doesn't get out of hand. Once the fire has burned itself out, they return over the next few days to monitor the smoldering embers. In the prairies, a lot of what we're doing is reducing the dead component out there, um, keep the grasses young and healthy, and 
we try and reduce the amount of hardwood encroachment um, coming out of the hardwood hammocks, tropical hardwood hammocks in tree islands. It seems to be a remarkably stable environment out there and so mostly what we're doing is just maintaining that ecosystem in, in its current state. Everglades National Park, covering 1.5 million acres, is huge. Of this area, Dave Loveland estimates that over 600,000 acres are fire dependent. In any given year, I try and burn somewhere between 12,000, 30,000 acres. Um, we're trying to increase that as time goes on. Ideally, um, I would say that we'd probably be sitting at probably 60,000 acres a year. Of that, we probably burn on average 5,000 acres of pines, and so the vast majority of the rest of that is prairies, um, sawgrass or um, Muhlenbergia prairies. When it became clear to resource managers that pines had adapted to fire, they then discovered the essential benefits fire brings to the pinelands. The pines, there's no lower branches. They're, they're self-shedding of the lower branches. Um, these, basically, these trees are, are built to burn. Um, you're not going to get any ladder fuels carrying up into the crowns. Fire-dependent pinelands grow directly on nutrient-poor limestone bedrock the skeletal remains of a prehistoric coral reef. In this harsh environment, the main source of nutrients for pineland plants is the ash produced by fires. Not long after a fire, the ecosystem teems with new life. To see the flowers, to see the insects, to see the wildlife grazing and using the area, that's a very creative process and I think that's something that humans do very well and I think for eons, in this unbroken relationship with fire that humans have, we've been able to create very productive landscapes with fire. That's one of the things that gives me great satisfaction. The irony with fire is that for decades, managers thought they were saving an ecosystem by preventing fires, when in reality, they were suffocating it. Some research has shown that in a sawgrass, for, sawgrass prairie, for example, if, a, if it goes without burning for uh, 20, 25 years, the actual dead component of the sawgrass will t start to choke out the, the live mass. It'll be, you know, you're locking up all those nutrients and it'll start to transition into a, um, basically, a mud flat. Prescribed fire is an essential tool for maintaining balance in a fire-loving landscape. It is crucial to the health of the South Florida ecosystem and for protecting residential communities near these areas. As suburbia pushes out into fire-dependent wilderness, it will be increasingly important for people to understand the role of fire in the ecosystem.